and leading with style, getting the best from your MBTI type webinar. My name is Kim Rivera, and I'm the Associate Marketing Manager here at CPT. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar will run approximately 90 minutes. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please submit them to me through the questions function in the webinar controls. Patrick will be pausing throughout the webinar today to answer your questions. Representatives from CPT's education team are also in attendance. Jim Larkin, Jack Powers, and Zinnia Mitchell. They'll be available to answer your questions as well. With all of our webinars, today will be recorded and we'll be sending out the link to the recording in the next few days. Please note the PowerPoint slides are not available for our Ask an Expert series. Okay, it is time for our contest. Uh, we have a special giveaway this time, which is CPT's newest ebook, Cycles of Success, A Guide to Career Development and Assessment Insights. We have printed a very limited quantity, and we're giving away five copies to the top tweeters today. Here are the rules. Follow at CPT Education on Twitter. Use hashtag CPTAAE in all tweets. This is how we can track your tweets share relevant and quality content, and have fun and learn a lot. This contest will end today at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and the winners will be announced through Twitter. Now, I'm very happy to welcome CPP's Ask an Expert, Patrick Kerwin. Patrick is the owner of Kerwin & Associates in San Diego, California, and an MBTI Master Practitioner. For over 20 years, he has used the MBTI instrument to develop individuals, teams, and organizations. He conducts MBTI workshops on a variety of topics, including stress, team building, career development, leadership, change, and conflict. Patrick also conducts the MBTI certification program and is the author of True Tight Tales, a collection of stories about the power of personality types in everyday life. So please join me in welcoming Patrick as I turn over the webinar to him. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much, Kim, and welcome to everyone to today's webinar. So as Kim said, I've used the Myers-Briggs for 24 years now. I have my own business, and my entire business revolves around the MBTI instrument. So I like to refer to myself as a one-trick pony. It's the thing I know. And uh, one of the ways that I use time is working with leaders and in leadership development programs. So all the material you're going to see today is from the work with those leaders and with uh, the leadership development programs. So specifically what we're going to do today is we are going to examine different ways of expressing leadership. And we're going to be looking at how type really shows up in leadership in different ways. And that will be woven through our entire webinar today. Then we're going to discover how type dynamics influences leadership. So we're going to take a, a deep dive pretty quickly into type dynamics. And if it's new to you or if it's a little rusty, um, I'm going to do a little refresher for you so that you'll understand what type dynamics is all about. And then we're going to explore what different types naturally gravitate toward when leading and what they're likely challenged by when leading. And again, we're going to look at that through a type dynamics lens. And then you're going to hear some real-life examples of people with different MBTI types and how they lead others or lead themselves. So um, I do like to practice what I preach when I'm uh, using type in workshops, and so I want to make sure and include different preferences in the workshop. So you're going to get a little blend of sensing and intuition in today's webinar. Uh, you're going to get intuition when we talk about type dynamics, because I'm going to talk about what the theory suggests in terms of leadership and what types might be drawn to and challenged by, uh, but you're going to get some sensing by hearing some real life examples. And in fact, you're going to get some really fresh ones because I just did a leadership development program <clears throat> up in uh, San Francisco on Friday. And when I was on break, so at lunch, I was running up to different people and saying, so hey, you're an ISTP, so how does your type show up in leadership? And so you're going to get a lot of really uh, very fresh and very current examples. Uh, the other thing I'm going to wrap up with is this last little comment here about you know, leading others or leading themselves. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about people who um, really want to lead themselves and what that might look like. So that will be kind of our, our wrap up. 
All right, when I was putting together this webinar, I thought, well, you know, what is leadership? I mean, I know that you know, there's different definitions out there from the programs I work with. So I went online and just looked at some of the uh, websites that came up pretty quickly. And one of them was from one of the branches of the military. And I picked out a few key words and how they relate to some of the different preferences on the MBTI. So they talked about enthusiasm and initiative, and these were uh, words that seem to be describing extroversion in their definitions. Uh, they talked about judgment, and judgment in their definition was really talking about having common sense. So it seemed to be really referring to sensing. Uh, they talked about justice, and in the definition it was really talking about you know, weighing pros and cons, being objective, it seemed to be uh, referring to T. And then decisiveness, and their definition seemed to refer to J. So I thought, well, that made some sense because you know, it's a military organization, and so they were kind of um, holding up E and S and T and J as kind of the, the leadership qualities. And I thought, well, let me keep looking. And then I found uh, another article that was talking about some of the new qualities of leadership. And one of them was humility. And the description seemed to uh, be describing introversion. Uh, patience, because they were talking about looking at many, many different ways of doing things and being open to new uh, ways of doing things, and that seemed to relate to N in its description. Empathy, and they had many, many other words that uh, related to the feeling preference. And then balance, and again, I'm not giving you their full descriptions, but uh, what they seemed to refer to was you know, being able to kind of go with the flow as life required. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. They're saying that sort of I, N, F, and P are some of the new leadership qualities. So I kept looking, and then I saw um, an article by a big management association. They talked about being an incredible communicator. And, uh, and their description actually related to both E and I. Uh, they talked about communication in terms of communicating very quickly to many people, but also listening and choosing words carefully. So I couldn't really tell if it was uh, there's a little E and I in there. Uh, visionary and strategic, so that sounded like N. Uh, good at dealing with conflict and real comfortable dealing with conflict and results oriented. So we had some, you know, E or I and then N, T, J. And I thought, okay. And I thought, well, what about some other non kind of business organizations? What do they say? So I looked at some faith based uh, organizations, nonprofits, and uh, one of them had something about being a big picture thinker, which relates to N, and then celebrating successes, which is F and might be. Uh, e, N, F, and P all together celebrating successes. So I thought, wow, you know, you look at this and there are just all these different ways to define leadership and it makes sense based on kind of the mission or the purpose of the organization and and um, what qualities they, they see are necessary. So, you know, what is leadership? Well, it depends, I guess, on who you ask. For our purposes today, what is leadership? is I'm going to refer to the definition that actually is in the Introduction to Type and Leadership booklet. And that definition is accomplishing change through the efforts of others. I really like that definition because it's very type inclusive. Because unlike the other definitions I just gave you where you could kind of trace them or, or match them to different preferences on the MBTI, when you look at this statement, actually what you can see is you can accomplish change through the efforts of others in an extroverted way or an introverted way. You can use sensing or intuition, thinking or feeling, judging or perceiving. And uh, in fact, the author of this book, that Sharon Richmond, talks in there about you know, 16 paths to leadership. And I think that's really what this definition says, is that you know, leadership in terms of these qualities can be accomplished by um, each of the 16 types, just in very different ways. So we'll look at that today. Also in that booklet is a, a type distribution of leaders. And the CPP gathered 122,800 um, leader types. So they looked at people who had taken the Myers-Briggs and who met criteria of being in leadership roles and looked at the type distribution. And in some ways, this is like a validity study because what we know if type is true is that certain types are drawn to certain occupations or certain roles. So if type is true, you'd expect certain types to be drawn to leadership. And so I'm going to show you the type distribution that they found of these 122,800 people. And I'll put the type table up and give you 
a rare introverted moment to absorb that table and take a look at it. Here it is. All right, so a couple of observations, and one is that obviously there are some types that have very high percentages and some that don't have high percentages. But the other thing that's really significant and significant to remember when you're looking at leadership or quite frankly any other occupation or role is that what you see here is all 16 types are represented. So what we know is that all 16 types lead, they'll lead differently, and that naturally certain types are attracted to uh, leadership. So let's look at the sample of leaders, and I picked out the uh, six most represented types. So the number one most represented type was ESTJs at 16.7%. ISTJs next, 15.2%. ENTJs at 8.9%. ENTPs at 8.3%. ENFPs at 6.5%. And INTJs at 5.8%. Now, I just want to say something here, and I want to make sure that you know, we all understand these are not the only six types that can lead. Uh, we don't know how effective they are at leading. All we're saying is that somehow they are attracted uh, to leadership. So what I want to do is look at these 16 types and see if we can make some sense out of this using uh, type dynamics. And um, if you need a refresher, by the way, after the webinar is done, you can take a look at your MBTI manual. And on page, starting on page 29, there's a great section in there that takes you through what is type dynamics. There's a whole formula for figuring out type dynamics, and it's included in there. Um, if this is really new to you or a type is new to you, uh, you could also think about doing a certification program for the Myers-Briggs because we get into a lot of depth on type dynamics in that program. But the short version is that uh, Jung's theory proposed that the middle sets of letters were the core mental functions. So S, N, and then T and F. And what he said is that each of the 16 types has access to all four of those functions. So each of us has access to sensing, intuition, thinking, and feeling. Um, however, each of the 16 types prefers those four functions in a different order. So if you're an ISTJ, those four functions have an order at one, two, three, four in a certain way. And if you have a preference for INFP, those four functions have an order one, two, three, four in a different arrangement than ISTJs have them. And uh, those four functions, the first one is called the dominant function. And that is often the lead part of the personality, the favorite part of your personality. Uh, it's most conscious. It's the part of your personality you kind of reach for first. So in your type, one of the two middle letters will be your dominant function, and the whole formula helps you figure out which one's which. I'll give you the answer key in a few minutes. Uh, the second of your middle letters uh, is called your auxiliary function, and that is there for balance and support for the dominant. So your two middle letters will be dominant and auxiliary in some order, and they work together. Um, that leaves the other two letters that aren't part of your type, the other two functions. One of those is called the tertiary, which is your third favorite. And the hey, last Patrick, one is called... It Hello? looks like your slides aren't showing. If uh, you right could just double just check this, your slides. Um, right now the slide just says how type dynamics influences leadership. Correct. Yes, that's the only one that should show right now. All right. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is the inferior function, which is the least favorite. Uh, least conscious, least preferred of all the functions. So we've got S, N, T, and F, and each of the 16 types has a preference for those in a certain order. So with that in mind, let's look at these six types and see what they have in common. So we see here that four of these types have T and J as part of their type. 
And the formula for type dynamics tells us that all TJs have something in common. And they all have extroverted thinking as part of their type. And extroverted thinking is using thinking, which is about objectivity and logic, uh, using that thinking to organize the world around them. So what you'll often hear from TJ types is, you know, here's a logical way to get things done. All right, here's, here's how things should get done. And so all four of these types have extroverted thinking as either their dominant or their auxiliary function. So it's right there, it's sort of the, the lead or second favorite part of the personality. And so when you think about it, it makes some sense that types that have extroverted thinking as either their dominant or auxiliary would be drawn to roles where they could say, hey, you know what, here's the logical way to get things done. All right, let's look at the other two types in that list, the ENTP and ENFP. And people that have N and P in their type also have something in common, <clears throat> in that they all have extroverted intuition as part of their personality. And for these two types in particular, extroverted intuition is the dominant function. So it is the lead part of the personality. It's the part that they go to first, that they reach for, uh, that they have the most energy around. And so um, extroverted intuition is kind of like it's brainstorming. It's coming up with new things. So it'll often sound like, you know what? I have an exciting new idea. And that's what extroverted intuition sounds like. So if you think about that, it makes sense that people that want to do new things, try out new ideas, would be drawn to roles where they have the influence and, uh, and power to really uh, play with those new ideas. All right, I want to show you another sample. And this is a sample of mine uh, from January of this year. And I did a keynote for the top 158 women leaders of a large pharmaceutical organization. And it was on type and executive impact and influence. And so all of them took MBTI complete before coming to the keynote. And so I was able to look at the types of the participants and put together a type table. And so I'm going to show you this type table here. Give you a minute to look at that. And so what I put in red there were the five types that were most represented in that particular sample. And if we want to look at those in order, Um, five of those types are the same five types that were in the CPP sample. They're in a different order, but they're still all there. And again, you've got the extroverted intuition type, and then our four TJ types. Uh, the only one that really changed from this sample to the last sample were ENFPs, and CPP sample was a much broader sample. It included a lot of industries. This is obviously one industry. It's pharmaceutical, it's very scientific, so in general there are more T's attracted to that kind of industry. There seems to be something there about extroverted thinking and uh, extroverted intuition that seems to uh, draw people to these roles. Now knowing that all 16 types can and do lead, now let's take a look at each type uh, individually and look at what they're most drawn to and what they are most challenged by. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, the introverted types. So I'm going to start with introverted types that have sensing as their dominant function. And then I'll go to introverted types that have intuition as their dominant, T and F. Then we'll take some questions, and then I'll come back and do extroverted types, and do extroverted types that have sensing as their dominant, and so forth. So let's start with ISTJs. So ISTJs gravitate toward leadership activities that call on their dominant introverted sensing. So dominant introverted sensing is really paying attention to specifics, accuracy, precision, uh, being very, very clear about what needs to be done and the steps that need to be taken to do it. Uh, they have auxiliary extroverted thinking. And so what they want to do is they want to accomplish very specific goals. So they're going to look at what exactly needs to be done, what policies, what are the procedures, and then how can we actually get those uh, goals accomplished. 
Now they can be challenged by leadership activities that call on their inferior extroverted intuition. So what you're going to see here is for ISTJs, if their favorite thing is being specific and accurate and precise, their least favorite thing is the exact opposite of uh, being in the world of ambiguity, what if, uh, things that don't exist. So oftentimes ambiguity uh, can be very difficult. What if thinking can be really difficult for ISTJs. Um, even delegating is a very common challenge for ISTJs because it means letting go. And uh, introverted sensing, if you do it yourself, you know exactly what it is and how it's getting done. And when you delegate it, you kind of let it go into the unknown. And then uh, they have tertiary feelings, so also activities that involve, you know, how are people doing, how am I doing, uh, can be a challenge for ISTJs. You see we don't have extrovert or introvert by that tertiary, and that's because there's still a lot of debate in the type community about how people use their tertiary uh, function. So, for example, if you ever look in an introduction to type booklet and look at any one of the 16 types in there, you'll see that the tertiary uh, isn't described as being extroverted or introverted. So that's kind of the end description of the ISTJ. Let me give you a sensing example of how that shows up in leadership. And um, I worked last year with a physician. I do a lot of physician leadership uh, programs. And she had preferences for ISTJ. And she came in as part of a leadership program. I did a Myers-Briggs workshop. And she had previously done her 360. And when she got her Myers-Briggs results back and saw that she was an ISTJ, she said, you know what, this makes so much sense. Uh, she goes, I understand my 360 feedback. And I said, why is that? She said, well, because when I took my 360, she said, I rated myself on strategic planning as one of my like, highest skills. That was one of the things I was best at. And she said, when I got my 360 results back, she said, my boss, my peers, and the people that report to me, rated strategic planning as one of the worst things I do. And she was so shocked that when she got this back, she said, I think I understand this, because she said, my version of strategic planning is this. It's from my sensing. She said, it's tell me where we're going, and I can tell you the steps to get there. And I said, well, what do you think your leader's or your boss's perspective is? And she said, oh, I think he's an N, and his is tell me where we're going that we haven't gone before. And she said, so now I, I think I understand why that's such a challenge for me. Now, there's something I want to mention, um, and that is a little word about type development leadership. Because I just told you what IFTJs are naturally drawn to and challenged by. But uh, type development says that as we go through life, we take a greater interest in developing our tertiary and inferior functions. So accessing them more comfortably and using them more comfortably. So I don't want to say that, gee, ISTJs will never be able to do brainstorming, never be able to delegate, because as ISTJs develop, they get more comfortable using their tertiary and inferior. So what the theory says is that for ISTJs in the first half of life, uh, people are spending most of their time on their dominant and auxiliaries and really uh, specializing in their types. And then when they get into the, quote, second half of life, uh, they get more comfortable with, you know, how am I doing? How are other people doing? Uh, what if we did this? And for ISTJs, it gets easier to do this once they kind of work with something that they know and that's logical. And when they have that foundation, then it's more comfortable for them to think about people and uh, possibilities. Okay. And I have a lot of examples of uh, friends and colleagues who work in universities and career centers or in uh, in student advising roles who are ISTJs, who I would describe as being really uh, well-developed ISTJs in that they are ISTJs at their core, but they are so comfortable thinking about the impact on people and new ways to do things. So just something to keep in mind. All right, let's look at ISFJs. And ISFJs kind of similarly gravitate toward leadership that also calls on their dominant introvert sensing. So they have the same dominant as ISTJs. So they're also focused on accurate, accuracy, precision. Uh, but they have auxiliary extroverted feeling. And extroverted feeling is kind of asking, you know, how's everyone doing out here? So um, they're making sure that there's harmony on the team, that each person's okay. 
and that they're making sure that they're serving the teams and the customers' needs. So that's kind of the, those are the activities they naturally gravitate toward. Uh, they can also be challenged by the extroverted intuition, so the what-if thinking, and tertiary thinking. Uh, so that can be engaging in conflict, for example. Uh, I have two examples of this from my leadership program on Friday. And uh, I asked uh, the two ISFJs who were in a physician leadership program, you know, how does your ISFJ kind of show up? And they said, as uh, they're, with their dominant, they really like to know exactly what it is they're supposed to be doing and how they can get it done step by step by step. But the feeling, they said, they go out to all of their teammates and they want to make sure everybody's okay. So they said they'll go out to their teams and say, how you doing? You know, do you need anything? Uh, are you okay? And that's how they bring their feeling in. All right, let's go to introverts who have dominant intuition. We start with INTJs. Um, they gravitate toward leadership activities that call on their dominant introverted intuition. And dominant introverted intuition is kind of like brainstorming with yourself. It's kind of swirling around inside, looking at, uh, for INTJs, it's looking at insights, at visions, at strategies. And their uh, extroverted thinking is looking at driving toward results. So they come up with these insights and strategies for the future based on their introverted intuition. And then the extroverted thinking says, OK, and here's the logical way to get the strategy done. Uh, they can be challenged by inferior extroverted sensing. And extroverted sensing is about experiencing the outer world, and in work it can show up as uh, fighting fires, going from meeting to meeting to meeting, uh, very quick action, quick decisions. Um, INTJs, because they do enjoy the inner swirl, can find kind of jumping from one activity to the next to the next. Uh, to be frustrating and actually kind of a waste of time because they'd rather kind of look inside at how everything connects. Uh, they can also be challenged by their tertiary feeling, which is, again, how am I doing? How are other people uh, doing? Um, I worked with an INTJ last year up in Washington. I was doing a team building, and he was the leader. And, uh, and he was great. He would kind of throw out ideas. He would listen to the group. And then what he would do is you could tell that you know, wheels were spinning on the inside. And then he would formulate this strategy and just come out and say, OK, you know, I've been listening to all of this. Here's how it all connects. Here's, here's where we should go as our team. And let's go. Like, how are we going to achieve this? And uh, so he really was, was uh, great at kind of formulating this very clear, concise strategy uh, for the team. OK, INFJs also have dominant introvert intuition. And they're having insights and visions, usually about things that they care about quite deeply. It can be people, uh, uh, movements, uh, the world, because they have auxiliary extroverted feelings. So their insights or visions are about people or ways to make the world a better place. It's kind of you know, what is the right thing uh, to do. Uh, they can be challenged by leadership activities that also call on that extroverted sensing, so that quick action, meeting to meeting, and their tertiary thinking, so engaging in conflict very easily. Uh, I worked with a president of a big university who's an ISJ, and, uh, and I watched him as he kicked off a leadership retreat, and he really, you could tell he had really formulated these, uh, these very deep uh, insights for his team, his big vision. And then he came out and really kind of almost touched each person in the room to kind of inspire them to, uh, to work toward this vision uh, that he has. And it was actually it was pretty amazing to, to watch him do that. And uh, so his, his introverted intuition was definitely a play, and he uh, actualized it through his extroverted feeling. OK, let's go to introverts who have thinking as their dominant function, ISTPs. And uh, dominant introvert thinking. Uh, introvert thinking is about going inside and bringing logical order to the inner world. It's coming up with a logical framework uh, to explain all these things that are going out on in the outer world, all these activities and all this information that they get in from their extroverted sensing is all going inside. And they're trying to figure out, OK, what's the logical framework to fix 
fix whatever it needs fixing. So they kind of look on the outside, they look through their extroverted sensing, what needs to be done, and then their introverted thinking says, how do I fix it? Uh, their challenge can be their extroverted feeling, which is the impact on others. Um, it's showing appreciation, expressing their own feelings, and a tertiary intuition, so working with the unknown. Um, on Friday, there was an ISTP in this leadership program, and so I asked him uh, to give me an example of his type uh, as a leader. And he had this, this ready example that he had just worked on with his team, and it was about uh, redoing, reworking compensation on his team. And so he gathered all this data, and then he put himself in his office and came up with this spreadsheet that was perfectly logically organized in terms of kind of how to redistribute compensation on the team. And so uh, you know, he took from some team members and he gave to other team members, and then he presented it at this meeting. And he thought he had this sort of airtight, logical, database solution. And uh, he said someone on his team that has a preference for F actually had a real reaction to it and said, you know, we're not just numbers on a spreadsheet and you're making it look like you know, some people are losers and some people are winners. And, uh, and he said, um, he said it actually was really annoying for him when the person started saying these things. But to his credit, and this is the sort of type development in motion, as he said, he actually realized how important the messaging of this very logical solution, how important it was. And, uh, and he hadn't really thought about it. He hadn't thought about you know, sort of different ways to look at it. And so he said, you know, really, actually, that event really taught him something as an ISTP leader, which was kind of, kind of awesome. All right, INTPs, they also have dominant introverted thinking, so they're also creating a logical inner framework. But their extroverted intuition is what they're trying to solve. They're drawing activities where they can complex team challenges. So you know, the most con uh, complex concepts, the most diverse concepts, uh, taking all of that information, those possibilities, those different ways of looking at things, taking it in, and then trying to find really kind of this very um, elegant solution uh, for these really complex issues. Uh, they also can be challenged by that extroverted feeling, again, that messaging and how do people respond to uh, the, these elegant solutions. And uh, have, they have tertiary sensing, so looking at the specifics and practicalities. Um, I worked with a team last year, and there was an INTP leader there. And you, what you would see uh, with him on the team is he was very curious, that extroverted intuition. He'd be very curious, very open to other ways of looking at things. Um, but on the inside, you know, his little wheels were spinning in terms of trying to figure out kind of this elegant solution. And what he would do is he would listen, he would ask questions, and then he would present this kind of what I will describe as wisdom. Uh, you know what's really going on here is this. He kind of came up with this very logical solution and logical conclusion, and, uh, and people really uh, listened. He had a little problem in his delivery that he was, uh, he, wasn't, he was always starting his delivery with. Do you understand what's going on here? <laughs> and when he, I watched him, and when he would do that, people would shut down. And so we had a conversation about, you know, that's an extroverted feeling thing, like people weren't responding really well to that. And as a result, all of his wisdom was really uh, getting lost. So that was his type development uh, activity. All right, let's go to introverts who have uh, feeling as their dominant function. So for um, ISFPs, they have dominant introverted feeling. So they're drawn to activities really that that involve being respectful uh, for each person on the team, attending to those person's very specific needs, uh, being really careful with their teammates and making sure that teammates are being careful with each other and very respectful. Uh, what you'll often see about them is their extroverted sensing, so uh, they'll often be very uh, busy. Uh, they're uh, very flexible. They're kind of moving from task to task to task. But all the while, while they're doing that, they're making sure that everyone is being treated very respectfully. Uh, they can be challenged by activities that require them to engage their extroverted thinking, which is 
um, being directive, imposing decisions. So I've made a decision. Here's what we should do. Um, if you're you're wired to sort of respect each individual and uh, that person's own process, one of the hardest things to do is to tell them what to do. And then tertiary intuition, which is looking at new ways of, of doing things. Now, this is such a great example because ISFPs sometimes are not the type that uh, gets held up or jumps out as a leader type. I've worked with many ISFPs who are leaders. One in particular was a CEO of an organization. And, uh, and he I did a team building for him. And he definitely was an ISFP at his core. So when we did the team building, he listened really carefully respectfully each person. He clarified understanding to make sure, you know, the sensing one to make sure he really got it right. Um, every person was really heard. He really wanted to know what each person needed specifically on the team. But the thing about him is, and this is about type development again, is he ran this gigantic organization. So he had to learn to do extroverted thinking. He had to learn to say, look, here's the decision. Here's what we're going to do. He had to look at new ways of doing things. You know, where are we going? Where can we go that we haven't gone before? That was part of his role. But at his core, he still operated from this very uh, practical and sensitive place. Um, they have a new CEO now. has a very different style. No better or worse, but it's really different. And it's been a real big transition for that organization. All right, let's do uh, introverts. The last introverted type with feeling as their dominant, INFPs, so certainly not last. Uh, auxiliary extroverted intuition. So INFPs, too, uh, gravitate toward leadership activities that call on their dominant introverted feeling. So anything that resonates with those values and that has impact on um, others. And the extroverted intuition wants to have a big impact. So here INFPs talk about changing the world, wanting to have an impact. Um, on the world, on people, everywhere. So these kind of big, big visions that are grounded in what's really important to them. And um, they can be challenged, again, by this extroverted thinking and by the tertiary sensing of um, making sure that their ideas are practical and attainable. Great example of this, the leader I worked with uh, in February, INFP. And at the very end, she got up and talked to her team a little bit about her type. And she started off by saying, "There are I really care deeply about what we're doing. And there are some things that I, I, there are a lot of things I care about very deeply. If you want to know, let's have lunch. Let's come into my office, make, make some time. It's not something I share really easily, but um, I will tell you if you ask me. And she said, and I have really big goals. So you heard that sort of introverted feeling and that extroverted intuition. And she said, now I've had to learn to use my S and my T, because she said, I'm in a leadership role. And to get my visions heard and my values heard, I have to, be, uh, I have to go out and be strong and engage in conflict and be specific. And when she was done, I, I asked her, I said, did you read in your booklet all that stuff? And did you put it in that order? And she said, no, I was just talking from my heart. I said, well, you know what you just did is you just described your dominant your auxiliary and your tertiary and your inferior functions. I mean, it's pretty amazing. OK, so those are our introverted types. So uh, now, Kim, time for some questions. OK, thank you, Patrick. We have a few questions as well as comments. We have a comment saying, thanks for the introverted pauses. Somebody appreciates that. <laughs> and we have a question. Um, do we assume all leaders gravitate towards leadership? Might leader type skew by type thought out or recognized as leaders? Uh, OK, can you just repeat that? Sorry. Sorry. No problem. So do we assume all leaders gravitate towards leadership? Might leader type skew by type thought out or recognized as leaders? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. I guess what I can say, though, and I might address this a little later in the webinar, but I guess what I can say is, so do all leadership types assume leadership? Is that what it is? 
Well, we could have Kristen, if you're still on, you can elaborate on that question, and we'll move towards uh, the next question while she types more in. So we have a question from Barbara. Do dominant and auxiliary really make a difference, or is it more about extroverting or introverting the functions? Uh, so yes and both. So, so what we find is, I mean, you're hearing these examples of, you know, where people aren't sort of being, they're not being coached to say these things, but the way they're describing how they're approaching their work and approaching their leadership really seems to validate type dynamics. And there's been some work on type and change that shows that, you know, people aren't getting their dominant function needs met, that it can be challenging for them to engage in change. So we seem to have a lot of support for type dynamics showing up in many different ways. Leadership, change, uh, in careers is another great example. Is, you know, most people, of many people, will describe needing to have their dominant function and auxiliary function somehow satisfied in their work. Um, and then the extroverted and introverted part, what you're seeing here with these examples I'm giving you is that regardless of the first letter of your type, everyone extroverts and everyone introverts. So you, you have to have ways of operating in both the outer and the inner worlds. And that was part of Jung's theory. And it certainly is part of you know, working. It's part of leading. You need to spend some time extroverting and sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, introverting. That's why I think type dynamics is so important with leadership because it really does demonstrate that you know every type extroverts, regardless of that first letter, there's something that types do in the outer world. And then, uh, regardless of your first letter, you know you need to spend some time in your inner world. So that's kind of the balancing mechanism of Jung's theory is that we have we live in both of those places some of the time. All right, we have time for one more question at the moment. Um, a question from Brenda. When discussing dynamics, I thought you mentioned you, uh, you used the two middle letters, but then we looked at TJ, for example, not the middle two. Could you clarify? Yeah, and that's where I was referring to the manual on page 29, because it explains why TJ results in extroverted thinking. Uh, there's a whole formula for figuring out type dynamics. And so it does focus on the middle letters. So you're seeing in the slides that I'm showing now that you know we're talking about uh, you know introverting feeling and extroverting intuition. So it really is about those middle letters and where do you use them. And uh, the J and the P is there to kind of help us crack the code. And that's the uh, that's the type dynamics formula that ex that is explained in the uh, in the manual and in the certification program too. All right, we can move on to the rest of your slides, and then we'll have more questions at the end. OK, sounds good. All right, well, let's do our extroverted types. And I'm going to start with extroverts who have sensing as their dominant function. And so uh, EFTT, they have dominant extroverted sensing, and their auxiliary is introverted thinking. So what you'll see with that dominant function of extroverted sense, it's experiencing the outer world, you will see them being very active, very hands-on, uh, very practical, very busy, doing many things simultaneously. Uh, ESTPs will often say that extroverted sensing is uh, they like high-risk kinds of activities, firefighting. And that introverted thinking is kind of finding the logical way to kind of deal with all of these things that need to be done quickly in the outer world. Uh, they can be challenged by the opposite of their dominant, which is introverted intuition. And that's about uh, visioning, how does everything relate. So if you're a person who likes being really active and fighting fires really quickly, uh, one of the most challenging things is to kind of sit quietly, take time for reflection, to vision, to see how things interrelate. And uh, tertiary feeling, so uh, that can be a challenge for them. That question can be, you know, as I'm doing things quickly, have I forgotten about people, um, how people will respond to things? So I worked with an ESTP in Canada who is a leader in uh, HR and OD, and she talked about this, this dominant and auxiliary as really driving her in her work because she loved how busy her work was because she said she worked on things like, you know, conflict between people. 
uh, compensation issues, and the harder the better, you know, the more, the more difficult the better. Um, hiring, firing, all those things were really exciting to her because they needed to, you know, they needed quick action and they needed uh, quick solutions. And, uh, and she said, she goes, I'm working on these. She goes, I'm really trying to get comfortable with, you know, really thinking about impact on people. She said, I'm in HR, I got to think about that. And the introvert intuition, that was kind of a tough one because she said, I liked being busy. I didn't like kind of stepping aside and really, uh, you know, going inside and swirling. That just wasn't her favorite thing. So that's kind of her type development, uh, type development challenge. Um, ESFPs also have dominant extroverted sensing, so they also gravitate toward activities where they can be very busy, active, uh, and being really resourceful for people. They've got that introverted feeling, which is about, you know, um, what's important to me, being really respectful of people, uh, being respectful of the team, letting people kind of do things in their own way, but being really resourceful um, in the ways that they can get things done as a team. It's kind of like, you know, find out what people want, give them what they need, and the introverted feeling says, and let them do it in their own way. Uh, they can also be challenged by that visioning process and uh, by the tertiary thinking, so that, that pure objectivity, engaging in conflict very, uh, very easily. Uh, I have a good friend here in San Diego who was an individual contributor for many years, and when she was doing that, this it really suited her personality type because she bounced around from facility to facility in San Diego, which satisfied her extroverted sensing. So she got to go boing, boing, boing from place to place. And her introverted feeling, she was a real resource for people. She could connect people, give them what they needed. And so that really met her kind of inner value system. Uh, she was so good, and this is so classic, they promoted her out of what she did really well into a leadership role. And all of a sudden, she was sitting in, a in an office at a desk with the staff. She wasn't bouncing around anymore. And it was amazing to watch her, uh, her motivation plummet. So the question is, you know, does the dominant auxiliary really matter? Um, for her, it really did because it took away the favorite parts of her personality. It didn't really use the favorite parts of her personality. Uh, what she did after several years, it took her a while, is she kind of redirected that. And now what she does is she does this for her staff. So she kind of you know, finds out, what do you need? How can I help? She goes from person to person. And she gives them what they need just so that they can get their job done. So it's bringing in more of her, the core parts of her personality again. OK, let's look at extroverts who have dominant intuition. And so ENTPs, they gravitate toward leadership activities where they can use that dominant extroverted intuition. Um, that's the, you know, that uh, brainstorming, big ideas, and the introverted thinking wants them to be really well thought out and really logical. So they often want to come up with these very ingenious solutions to big, big problems. Um, you'll often hear from ENTPs, you know, they, they gravitate toward, you know, no one else has thought of this. Here's something that's you know, completely new. Um, if it ain't broke, break it is kind of the ENTP motto. So, you know, anything they can do to kind of push the envelope is what they gravitate toward. Uh, they can be challenged by inferior introverted sensing. And so ENPPs will describe this as those pesky details. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff. Implementation, steps to getting things done is not really uh, what they're drawn to. They're, they're really drawn to coming up with a big idea. And then uh, the tertiary feeling can be a challenge for them. You know, as they're kind of shaking things up, uh, forgetting to think about the impact on people. So sometimes that can be a challenge. Um, I had an ENTP, again, in Friday's uh, doctor who was a leader, and she talked about as an ENTP, she said, oh, totally, my favorite thing is, you know, flying into my team and saying, I have the coolest idea ever, and nobody's ever done this, and it's going to be awesome. And then she kind of tells people what it is, and then she said, and now just go figure it out. And she said, you know, I, I want other people to go out and do the steps. She goes, my strength is really coming in with, you know, the big new idea. OK, the other type that shares uh, dominant extroverted intuition are ENFPs. And so ENFPs also, that expert intuition, they love brainstorming, coming up with new ideas. Um, what they want to do is they want to process those ideas through 
their values and the values of others. So they kind of want to work collaboratively to get that big uh, picture done. So how can we all do this together, play together uh, with this new idea, and see where it goes? Uh, they can be challenged also by that SP details is what they'll call the introverted sensing. And then the tertiary is thinking, so a challenge can be uh, engaging in conflict. Not, not mediating conflict uh, with others, but actually engaging in it directly with themselves. Um, I worked with someone with a, a big uh, technology company a few years ago who was a leader, ENFP, and we were developing a Myers-Briggs workshop for them to roll out internally. And when we were, when I were, we were working that together, he said, I always remember this, because he's like, you know, we need, we need something new. We need something cool. We need something different. And then he said, we need MBTI bling. And I was like, MBTI bling, what is that? And so what he uh, talked about and what actually ended up getting, getting produced is something that actually CPP sells these now are those, those towers with the four cubes, and they have like E and I on the top one and an S and N. And, uh, and that's what he wanted, because he wanted something cool and like a like a toy that people could have you know, that was also a learning resource um, after they left the workshop. That was a great example of that, that ENFP in a leader role. OK, let's go to expert types that have uh, thinking as their dominant function. And these are ESTJs. And so ESTJs are really drawn toward leadership activities where they can get things wrapped up. So that dominant extroverted thinking is really driving toward a conclusion, driving toward getting things done. Uh, they have introverted sensing. So as they're getting things done, they usually have very specific goals in mind. So here's exactly what we want to get done. Um, they can be challenged by inferior introverted feeling, which is really asking themselves, you know, how am I doing? How is the team doing? Am I taking care of myself? Because they are driving toward the goal um, along the way, are they stopping to think about, you know, how am I doing? And then the uh, tertiary intuition is, you know, looking at sort of the big picture, taking the eye off of the end goal, but looking at, you know, how is the team interacting? That's how the N and F would come in together, is how is the team doing? Uh, an example of this, one of the, uh, uh, somebody I work with who actually leads one of these physician leadership programs is an ESTJ, and he knows a lot about type. He's actually uh, become MBTI certified. And we were talking about it over lunch on Friday, and I was talking, asking him how his ESTJ kind of shows up, and he said, believe me, he goes, I, that expert thinking, he said, I am totally driven. Like, where, where, how are we going to get, like, we're going to get there. Like, here's the end and we're going to get there, and here's how we're going to get there. Um, he needs some information and details. He has introverted sensing, but uh, the drive is really, OK, we've got enough information. Now let's get it done. Uh, but to his credit, and part of the reason he became MBTI certified, he's a great example of very well-developed ESTJ, is um, he's really worked on this introverted feeling, you know, how, or, how knowing himself, knowing others. Um, he said it's actually. It's the key part of the leadership development program he runs, uh, is, is having people really know themselves and know others. That's why uh, we use the Myers-Briggs in that program. And he said in the tertiary intuition, he said he's, he's become much more comfortable you know, being open to new ideas, um, kind of deviating from his very sensing specific goals uh, when he needs to. And I think as a result, he's a really, he's just a really um, tremendous leader. OK, ENTJs also have dominant extroverted thinking. So they're also driving toward uh, goals. Uh, but their introverted intuition is going to have big strategy as the focus. Um, so they're going to be really pushing to achieve strategies. So here's the vision. Here's what we need to get to. And now let's go, because we want to get there. Uh, they can be challenged also by that introverted feeling. From, you know, watching themselves, making sure they're not getting burnt out as they're really driving toward these big visionary goals that they've set. And then the sensing is uh, making sure these goals are actually reasonable, attainable. Um, I had an example of this a couple weeks ago. I was doing a team building in Toronto, and the leader has preferences for EMTJ. And as I was setting up the uh, workshop, it was an 
said, a full day workshop, and he said, you know, it's going to be a full day, and we've got big goals. He kept talking about big goals, which was that intuition, and he said, and we're going to get there, and we're going to, you know, work all day. We're going to work through lunch. It's going to be a working lunch, half an hour, and uh, and then two 10-minute breaks, and you can hear this, like, he had a really big goal, and he was driving to get there, and so it was before the MBTI workshop, so I didn't have a lot of he didn't really have a lot of language, but he didn't understand his type well enough yet because he hadn't gone through the workshop. But I had seen his results and uh, ENTJ, which is what he ended up owning. And there were several introverts on the team. And so I had to just you know, tell him, like, you know, the thing is, not everybody has your style. And you have these big goals you want to attain. I totally get that. But it could actually backfire if you do what you think is the best um, idea because actually, the sensing data is there are people who are different from you, and if you do what you want to do, other people aren't going to feel so great, and uh, you're not going to get the big outcome that you really wanted. Huh, so we did things my way. <laughs> so there you go. All right, ESFJs. Let's look at extroverts that have um, dominant extroverted feeling. And so extroverted feeling is uh, making sure that everybody is okay, how's everybody doing. So ESFJs, because they also have introverted sensing, are making sure that each person on the team is supported, you know, has exactly what they need, that they feel really valued. So it's getting things done, getting very specific, tangible goals done, but we're going to get them done together. Uh, they can be challenged by their inferior introverted thinking, and that can be engaging in direct conflict, um, you know, having conflict with a person, conflict in discussing an issue, and uh, and then the intuition, which is looking at new ways of doing things. Um, I did a workshop a few weeks ago, and the lead person there had preferences for ESFJ, and as we were getting ready for, as I was getting ready for the workshop. She wanted to ha have some time. She wanted to make sure that I knew each person on the team. So we went through, and I learned each person's name and what they did and what that person's roles were. And she talked to me about very specific needs that she had to bring the team together. This was the whole goal, was you know, to bring the team together and to uh, make sure that everybody really felt valued on the team. And that is what ESFJ can sound like. Okay, and then the last extroverted type we have is ENFJs. They also extrovert feelings, so they're making sure that people feel appreciated and uh, supported. And uh, they usually are operating with having some insights about people, relationships, interrelationships. So they'll have some kind of big goals, and uh, we're going to get to those big goals harmoniously and uh, together as a team. Uh, they can be challenged by inferior introverted thinking. So again, this kind of dealing with conflict really du uh, directly and uh, tertiary sensing, so making sure that their big ideas are uh, practical and reasonable. Uh, in January, I worked with the team and the leader. Uh, in the beginning, didn't know she had preferences for ENFJ or ENTJ. She said, I'm just not sure. And so um, as I listened to her open the meeting, she started off by making sure that each person was acknowledged in the room. So she was expressing this gratitude, which is something that ENFJs, a lot of types do that, but ENFJs are one of the types that want to make sure that they thank people and express gratitude. So she went around this team of about 20 people and, and made sure, you know, thank you so much for everything you did. You did so much work last year, touched every single person in that way. Um, and then she had every person talk about something they had done over their holiday break that was new or different. So it was kind of this, you know, personal uh, sharing, you know, extroverting feeling about something that was new, which is the intuition. Um, and then she talked about, you know, having this kind of big vision and we're a team, we can do this together, really seemed to, to lean toward ENFJ. Um, and then when we were in the workshop, you know, when you do activities around these different dichotomies, you're doing an EI activity, a lot of tension can arise that kind of is bubbling under the surface. And a lot of times that tension is really useful because people can then uh, decode it using type as a language and then figure out how to navigate um, through it. And so there were some really uh, 
tough conversation happening, which was really good. I thought it was actually moving the team forward. And what happened is it was really bumping up against what I saw as her extroverted feeling, you know, like want to make sure everybody's happy and getting along. And so uh, whenever the conversations would go there, she'd say, you know, I think we're making judgments. I, I think we're making judgments. And I'd say, actually, I think what we're really doing is, you know, we're really working through an issue using type. But it made sense. Like this need for harmony was really, really um, evident for her. And so at the end of the workshop, when she uh, finished, she en ended up owning ENFJ um, as her type. Okay, so we've looked at all uh, 16 types, and we see that uh, each of the types has certain activities are drawn to, things that they can be challenged by. Uh, we've looked at that certainly every one of the 16 types can develop their tertiary inferiors, so we don't want to assume those are going to be problem areas for people. Uh, but I also want to take a sort of a different look uh, at leadership and look at people that want to be individual contributors. And this is the part that I think may have answered the question that I wasn't clear on earlier, so we'll see if this, this answers it. Um, but we read a lot and hear a lot in, in organizations, at organizations, about leadership and that everyone's a leader and everyone needs to be taking leadership and define themselves as a leader. And, um, and what I have discovered is that there are actually people that are not interested in leadership in the way we defined it earlier, which was that accomplishing change through the efforts of others. And there are a lot of people of all sorts of different types that are really interested in being either an individual contributor or accomplishing change, but not through the efforts of others. Maybe it's through their own efforts. And sometimes when people want to accomplish change in that way, they will hear, well, you're still a leader. So what you're really doing is you're leading, but you're leading in a different way. And it's kind of like pushing leadership onto people. And they'll say, I, no, I, that's not really uh, what I want. So I just I want to end with this thought, um, a different sort of way, a uh, different thought on leadership. And I'm going to give you some examples. Um, so. One of my really good friends and colleagues is an uh, INFP. And so INFPs is a little reminder. They have dominant introverted feelings, so operating from these very deeply held values. And their inferior is extroverted thinking, which is here's a logical way to get things done. Um, he owned his own business for many, many years, was very successful, um, and made a career transition and actually transitioned into the world of the Myers-Briggs instrument. And so now what he does is he helps people learn the Myers-Briggs. He helps them learn about themselves through the Myers-Briggs. And we were having lunch uh, last month, and I was talking. we were talking about types and leadership. And he was just really clear. He said, I don't want to lead. I, I don't want to lead. He said, that's not what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do with my life. He said, what I really want to do is I just want to have an impact on others. You know, I want to share this information have people see how they can apply it in their lives and their work, but I don't want to lead. I don't want to lead them. I don't want to lead others. I just want to have impact. So um, really different way to use type in a way that has tremendous impact, but, uh, but isn't defined as leadership, and actually he doesn't want to be a leader. Um, so you might say, well, that's INFP. So. Doesn't that make some sense? Well, no, because actually here's an ISTJ example. And we saw ISTJs were one of the most represented types in leadership. Uh, my best friend was an ISTJ, and he led for many years and, uh, and didn't really like it. Because remembering ISTJs have dominant introverted sensing, so they like things to be precise and kind of predictable. And their inferior is extroverted intuition which is the kind of the uh, dealing with the unknown. And for him, people were really unknown. They were kind of you know, all over the place, and you couldn't really control them. And, and he really liked knowing exactly what he needed to do. And so he made a transition and became an individual contributor and uh, really enjoyed that role and really liked being able to do what he needed to do and do it well and not have to rely on um, um, others or, or leading the efforts of others. Um, that job that he liked so well was eliminated, and they moved him into a leadership role. 
And it ended up putting him kind of back at square one, where he was, you know, not really that satisfied um, leading leading people. Didn't want to be a leader. And then another one, um, ENTJ. And again, this is one of the types we see. It comes up uh, as one of the represented types of leadership. And this is a friend of mine. So ENTJs have dominant extroverted thinking, which is you know, here's the logical way to get things done. Um, but she wanted to get them done in her own way. She didn't want to tell everybody else the logical way. She wanted to kind of find out the logical way and then whatever it was, give it to the team. And so uh, she worked for her entire career as an individual contributor, did really well, actually retired early as a result of that. And as a great example of someone who was an individual contributor, didn't lead others, didn't view herself as a leader, uh, but was able to actually put together really good uh, plans and really good structure for uh, getting things done. So just a different, uh, different thought on leadership. So with that as a closing thought, Pam, I'm going to turn things back over to you and let you take it from there, and then we'll come back and do some questions in a little bit. All right, thank you, Patrick. I have a few things to share, and we'll then open up the forum for questions. Uh, we want to invite you to connect with us online. Make sure you follow us to keep up with the latest news, tips, and ad advice from our team of experts. And today, we are running a promotion for our webinar attendees. If you spend 250 or more, and you'll receive an MBTI TypePad mug, make sure to use promo code APRIL2015. The offer will expire on Friday, April 24th. This is not valid on previous purchases with other promotional offers or on international orders. It is also one per customer only. And please note that when you place your order, the complimentary mug will ship separately from when your purchases are shipped. If you are an international customer or would like more information on products and services, please go to cpp.com slash global sales. And if you haven't done so already, please check your email preferences by visiting cpp.com slash email press. Many of you don't receive our webinar invitations or follow-up emails because you may be unsubscribed from our system. This webinar is eligible for 1.5 NBCC approved CE clock hours, as well as MBTI master practitioner credit. All certificate requests will incur a $7.95 plus tax processing fee. In order to qualify to purchase a certificate, you must meet the eligibility requirements as noted on the screen. To be eligible, our system must show that you attended this live webinar for one hour or longer. The system will automatically track attendees by email and screen viewing time. If you are calling in and not viewing this on your screen, you are not eligible as our system cannot track phone calls. So I'm going to uh, go through some of the questions that we received throughout the webinar. I'm going to start with a question. Um, when someone says he does not want to lead, does he really mean he doesn't want to lead, or does he mean he doesn't want to manage others? Sometimes people use the terms interchangeably when they're not. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think um, sometimes it includes both, and sometimes it doesn't include both managing and leading. Um, so when people are talking about leading, I'm talking about specifically the definition that we used earlier, which is you know, that accomplishing change through the efforts of others. And so I'm talking about people who say that actual definition is really not what they want to do. Um, they want to accomplish change, but they want to accomplish it really through their own um, contributions, but not necessarily through the contributions of others. OK, thank you. We have a question from Lorna. How do you go about coaching leaders to engage their less preferred functions to realize better impact? Yeah, so I think a great example is that, that INFP I mentioned earlier is, you know, how do you get an INFP to really develop that, that thinking, the sensing and thinking that are tertiary and inferior? And whenever you're trying to develop 
your tertiary inferior, actually whether it's a leader or you're working with anyone, um, you need to do it in a way that's in service of your type. And so what that means is for an INFP, um, INFPs are more likely to develop their sensing and thinking if it's in service of um, getting, uh, being able to actualize these big visions and big insights that they think will change the world. And so when I look at the, the INFP that I mentioned, um, she developed her S and her T because she realized if she didn't do it, these things that she cared so much about weren't going to be heard in her organization because her organization is a very S and a very T organization. And so she learned that, you know, gee, if I kind of go, and she talked about going for a toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of these leaders and really getting into direct conflict and shoring up her ideas with a lot of data and a lot of background. She said she does that, but she does it not because it's her favorite thing to do, but because it really serves her big vision and her big purpose. And so it, it's when we try to work on our tertiary and inferior, when there's no connection to our dominant auxiliary, that it, it's a real, real challenge. So the, the trick is to get people to see um, you know, it was like the ENTJ boss I just mentioned, leader I just mentioned, who he wanted to have this big, you know, this big competent meeting. Um, well, if he was going to do it the way he was going to do it, it wasn't going to be big or competent. And so if he just took a step back, allowed people to have some time, uh, acknowledged that people are different and have different needs, then um, actually he would get to his big vision and his big goal uh, a lot more quickly. So for him, that was kind of what I—that was kind of the worm I had to put on the hook uh, to get him to really uh, listen to a new way of doing the workshop. Okay, a question from Helen: In your experience in research, what happens to leaders that suppress their dominant function as a result of the culture of the organization? Hmm. I don't know if I have any research on that. I'm trying to think. Uh, well, I'll give you an example that seems to have come up um, last week. And I met with a, an uh, ISFP physician who came up to me and said his organization was very much the exact opposite four letters of his type. And, uh, and what he was doing is, so he, this is a type dynamics recap, as ISFPs have dominant introverted feeling and their auxiliary is sensing, so they're being very, very careful of the needs of each person and, uh, and attending very carefully to the needs of each person. And the organization was much more sort of, you know, what's the big picture? How do we get there? And he talked to me about, you know, that it was really hard for him to, to, to try to navigate in that kind of culture. And so we talked about a couple things. I said, one is, um, first of all, he'll probably be most impactful if, as, as a leader if he leads from his own style. So he had been trying to kind of be something he wasn't, and, uh, and, he, and at the expense of his whole type. So what he had done is he, he kind of was trying to be this you know big visionary, very direct person, and he really wasn't. He was this really kind soul at his at his heart. So we talked about. You know, lead from your style, and I think this is the moral of the story with the Myers Briggs. Is you know, lead with your style, and then if you can, then bring in those other functions um, to support that. Kind of, it's kind of back to the, the INFP example. You know, is like lead with your style and bring in the others to have even more oomph behind your style. Now the thing is, he, there was so much. It wasn't clear to me there was a lot of appreciation for his way of doing things. And that's in a real stark contrast to the INFP I mentioned, who you know have these these big visions. But the organization seemed to really want to listen to those, and she was able to learn their language. This guy, it didn't sound to me like his organization really was interested in you know a leader who was really kind and sensitive and respectful. And so you know we talked about okay, let's see if we can get you to lead from your lead from your core, lead from your heart, and also. You know, what are some ways that you can bring in intuition and thinking more into your uh, delivery of these things that you think are really important to your, your patients and to your team members? Um, but if that doesn't work, then uh, sometimes people have to, to make a shift and uh, find, uh, find an organization that really it doesn't have to match their type, 
in any way, shape, or form that it needs to somehow um, you know, value or respect the contribution that their type can make. We have a question from Karen. I am an AD, and my director has the exact opposite type as me. We tend to butt heads more so than be consistently on the same page. Any insight into how opposite types can draw on strengths to partner better? And FYI, Karen mentioned she's an INTJ. OK. Um, so yeah, I was, just, I was talking about this last week with a leader who's a friend of mine. And she's leading a team that's really challenging. And, uh, and we, we talked about you, know, you, you kind of all have to be on the same page to start with in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. And um, so I'm going to give another, another different example of a team that just came to mind that I worked with last year that uh, was really butting heads. And so when I started the, the, the team building, I went around the room and asked them, like, why are you on this team? And this was a team of people that didn't, weren't required to be on this team. They could have very easily left and gone to another part of the organization. So I said, you're all on this team, and yet you're, you're thinking of all this trouble and conflict, so why are you here? And we started off and we went around the room and they all said the same thing. They were all focused on, you know, if this product actually comes to fruition, it is going to have a huge, it's going to change lives around the world. And when every person around the room said that, I was like, okay, you know what, we're fine. Like, now we're just going to talk about why you're, you know, you're different in sensing and intuition and how do you communicate with each other in ways that make sense to each other. But we're not dealing with competing interests in terms of, you know, who really, uh, which is the right way to go. They were all unified on where they were going. Their preferences just showed us they were going to get there in different ways, and that can create conflict. So I guess what I would say is the first thing is, you know, are you both focused on the same you know, mission or goal, and is that and are you really both really on board in the same way? Um, and if you are, then what happens is, you know, type becomes sort of the way that you get there. If you're an INTJ trying to talk to an ESFP, as an INTJ, you're probably going to have like you know the strategy of the department, and you know here's what we can do to be the best department, and and uh, and here's here are all these you know interconnections that I see. Um, for an ESTP, or sorry, an ESFP, um, they're really interested in sort of like practical action, being resourceful. How does this strategy really, you know, contribute directly to our students? How does this contribute to our numbers? So whenever you're presenting your strategy or these new visions for the department, if that's what you're trying to do, um, that you you really need to try to speak that in as much. Um, ESFP language as you can. And I think, you know, the thing is, like, when you are working for someone, I mean, leaders need to learn to understand different types so they can lead effectively and flex. But when you are working for someone, I think it's even more important to kind of try to flex your style uh, to get your message across. That's why when I did this workshop where the INFP got in front of her whole team of 40 people and talked about here's my style, and here's, if you want to understand me, here's, here's who I am. And I thought, man, if I were sitting in that room, and she just gave me the owner's manual on how to reach my boss, you know, how to reach my leader. And so, uh, so I think that's, a, you know, that's, that's just that's gold if you understand the, what your leader needs. Kathy has a question from a previous slide. Can you expand on the ESFJ and ENFJ engaging in conflict? Inferior introverted thinking, what does that look like? Yeah, so inferior introverted thinking for those two types, it's, um, if you just think about like this, this vacuum sealed container where uh, things are analyzed completely objectively and logically, and any sort of relational factor, interrelational factor uh, does not seep in. And so introverted thinking is really being able to look at things purely logically and looking at what's wrong with things, not in terms of impacting people, but just what is wrong with either this, this goal or this system. Uh, what's the logic? And what happens for ESFJs and ENFJs is because they have dominant extroverted feeling, 
it's very uh, it's natural for them to automatically go to, well, wait a minute, but how are people going to react to this? Or how do I feel about this? Um, how am I going to, oh, I don't want to, I don't want this to, you know, create all this tension on the team. It, it can be very challenging for those two types to, to engage in this, like, this purified um, objective analysis. Jeanette's asking a question from earlier on in the webinar, asking, what was the sample size in the CPP sample? It was, I think it was 122,800. But let me check on that sensing piece of information. Uh, 122,800, yes. Okay, great. And then we have a question from Nicole. Could you share how judgment is considered sensing? Yeah, I, you know, I didn't give you the, the, the definitions uh, because I didn't want to have like, you know, a gazillion slides on these on that topic. But um, the reason judgment ended up being sensing is because their, their description of judgment was about um, being, um, a, it was looking at things in a common sense type way, looking at what exactly, what things, what is, and, uh, and using common sense. And so the whole description uh, seemed to, to seem like it was sensing, despite the title. I know that the title of judgment seems like it might be something else, but in their description, it really seemed like sensing. Thank you. A question from Aaron. How can introverted thinkers develop skills in, in externalizing thoughts? Yeah, the, 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 so for introverted thinking types, it's the extroverted feeling is really what the the, the challenge is. And so, um, so I think what, what happens is for, so for people who have dominant introverted thinking, it's ISTPs and INTPs. And for those two types, that, you know, they want to come up with these, these great logical, they come up with these great logical frameworks and solutions. Um, and sort of the, the, you know, the worm on the hook for those types is that sometimes their great ideas or their great solutions will fall flat if they don't think about how they're presented, uh, if they don't think about how they're messaged. And so a good place to start is when they come up with this great solution, and I'm going to refer to the ISTP doctor who worked on that compensation project, is this is how you use type, is you go to someone who um, hopefully has extroverted feeling in their type. So you might go to an ESFJ or an ENFJ who has that as their dominant, and just say, like, look, I came up with this great solution. Here's my spreadsheet. Here's the logic. Um, how should I present this to the team? And you know, kind of, you can kind of outsource that to someone who has it as their dominant, and they can kind of help get you kind of kick-started um, and, and show you the ways to do that. That's a good first step, and then once ISTPs and INTPs kind of get the hang of it, they can start to do that more comfortably on their own. But the whole motivation for them is that otherwise this great solution that you came up with may not be received or may not go anywhere. And that's usually the motivation for change. Catherine wrote in saying, fascinated by the individual contributor leader concept. Is this a role that is also known as an informal leader? Well, I mean, I think that's what happens is because people keep trying to make them into leaders. <laughs> and they keep saying, okay, you can call me an informal leader, you can call me, you know, you can say I'm really leading in some way. But they, you know, the, 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 re the response that I've heard from these people and others is, like, really, I just, I don't need the word leader. And what happens is I think, you know, again, we kind of want to hold it up or raise that up in terms of the importance of that word. And, uh, and not everyone places the same importance or even actually the same need to be called the leader. So, I mean, that's why I wanted to kind of put that slide in there is to, you know, to challenge us to really think about, you know, do we need to be um, characterizing everyone as a leader um, and using that word? But they would, the answer to the question is they would say it doesn't even need to be an informal leader. Just call me, call me, call me anything. You don't need to call me a leader. Kwong Liam wrote in asking, what types would resist being in a leadership role? Um, you know, I think 
resist. Um, I think, I guess what I want to say is I could see that happening for any of the 16 types if it was a role that didn't allow them to use their dominant and auxiliary functions. I, I think that's what we see in careers. That's what we see in, in leadership is certainly one way to, you know, to, uh, to uh, lead, it, to have a career is to be a leader. So any, any situation that doesn't allow you to do what, uh, what is at the core of your type. So you could, I could see an ENTJ resisting a leadership role that didn't let them uh, have the, the power or the authority to say, look, here's the logical way to get things done. Um, I could see an ISFP, you know, resisting leadership in organizations that would say, you have to go around telling people, look, you know, here's what we're going to do and here's how we're going to get there. So, um, so I think this is why, again, this importance of the dominant auxiliary is it, it's why people uh, gravitate towards certain environments. When I showed the, the slide, the very early slide with the, the military, you know, ESTJ and then the uh, the nonprofit being the MF. Yeah, I think that's why certain types gravitate towards certain organizations where they can actually, you know, express their type in an organization that that values or uh, respects their type. Okay, Patrick. Thank you. We have a couple people inquiring, and not to put you on the spot, but they're inquiring to what is your MBTI type, if you're willing to share with us. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I um, have preferences for ENFJ, but I always want to qualify that and say I am in that second half of life uh, with, with, with type development, and so I am very uh, much more interested these days in the S and T part of myself. So that's why um, I'm you know, really interested in, in type being very practical and useful. That's kind of the sensing part of me coming out that wasn't always so prominent. And uh, the T part of me definitely comes out with, you know, when I do leadership workshops or team building where I'm definitely much more comfortable with conflict and sort of, you know, directly challenging uh, people where I wouldn't have done that so much before. So definitely ESJ um, at my core, but I, I'm definitely a, a different ENFJ now than I, than I was uh, earlier in, my, uh, in this whole type journey. All right, thank you. This has been a great webinar. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but we thank all of you for attending and asking so many excellent questions. Again, thank you, Patrick, <clears throat> for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. Thank you. Please visit our website at cpp.com slash askanexpert for future webinars and to find all of our previously recorded webinars. Thank you all for attending and have a wonderful day.